one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. This is Radio Free Mormon, on the air, broadcasting behind enemy lines. Tonight's episode, part two of the Corbridge Maneuver. Good evening, Bill. How are you doing today, uh, RFM? Here we are on day two. We've taken a 27-minute talk, uh, and we've already done two hours, and we've got probably another hour and a half to two hours to go. Uh, I, I thought part one was great. Really enjoyed uh, doing that. And, and I think there's still a lot of substance to this thing yet to dive into. Well, I agree. I will tell you that uh, when I talked about the Star Trek episode on which I riffed this title, the Star Trek episode was called The Corbamite Maneuver. I went back and I looked at the plot for that. And the plot seems to be particularly appropriate because, as any Trekkie will recall, what happens in The Corbamite Maneuver is basically that the Enterprise is threatened by this massive, massive ship that is going to destroy the Enterprise. They hear this voice saying, we're going to destroy you. And Kirk says, he makes up this total story, right? He says, well, we've got a load of Corbamite, which is a total fictional material, but the alien doesn't know that, right? You've got all this Corbamite on board, and what's going to happen is if you destroy us, it's going to explode so big, it's going to destroy you too. So he bluffs the alien, out of not destroying the Enterprise. And I think that when we talk about bluffing, based upon evidence and information that doesn't exist, we're going to see that Elder Corbridge does a really good job of using his own version of the Corbinite maneuver. This is, yeah, this will be fun. Um, I'll tell you, what I thought was important, as we got into the end there of part one, and, and as I was looking back, as I was doing the editing, I think you made some great points, and I just want to reiterate them to the audience. So the first one was something that I was mentioning earlier in the podcast episode, which was all roads lead to belief in the church. And I thought this was big because I think that once you understand that the church excuses away every possible scenario as the church is true, and here's how we do it. So for instance, we already know if you do get a spiritual experience, the church is true. If you don't, well, some people don't, and it's given to some to believe uh, in Christ and others to believe on their words. Um, if you get an experience that says the church is not true, well, then you've been deceived by the adversary. Well, maybe you're finding a problem with the historical information. Well, that's because you're focused on the secondary issues, and if you answer the primary questions, the secondary questions don't matter, and so then the church is true. No matter what happens, RFM. The church is true in every scenario. And as you were pointing out yesterday, uh, and I thought it was great, I mean, the the analogy that, you know, if you're sitting in a game of pick a card out of a deck and all 52 cards are aces of spades, like that's the way the church has set it up. Every single card answers out that the church is true. Um, You finished off episode one uh, with, I thought, was the two biggest things to come out of that conversation. One of those is the idea that the divine method that Elder Corbridge speaks of is absolutely – I mean, you could you could scientifically show this. It is the least effective way to arrive at truth. When you allow the divine method to trump the other three and you're trying to find the answers or solutions to questions, uh, it's going to be the least accurate way to do it. And we talked yesterday about how even church leaders – have contradicted themselves and held false positions for decades upon decades because they held on to the divine method. And the moment they let the other three methods trump, we then disavow our racism, we disavow the racist theories, we uh, begin to change the temple to make it uh, more have more gender equality, we start to let uh, women have more responsibility in the church, uh, we start to say that, hey, kids can ask for a second person behind closed doors with an untrained lay male leader. Like every time we say, like, let's look at the data and throw the divine method off to the side, we uh, have a better chance of arriving at the truth. And and then the final point you made, which was that the whole point in the divine method, the reason that one's so important is because it's the only method that the church can use to manipulate you into believing that the church is true. Yes, and this divine method, as he says in his own words, is really the weakest possible because we define the divine method in our church as the Holy Ghost speaking by the still, small voice. 
It is very still. It is very small. And frequently, the issue arises in the church of, well, how do I tell the difference between the still small voice of the Holy Ghost and my own personal opinions? I think that was a question that was asked in the past year at some kind of a youth or young adult face-to-face with apostles. This question comes up all the time. And notice what Elder Corbridge does. He takes the still small voice and he tries to make it something stronger and bigger than it really is. He does it rhetorically, and he does it toward the end of the last part we played at the end of part one, where he says, although the voice of the Spirit is usually a still small voice, it is nevertheless ever sure. See what he's doing there? He's trying to make it more sure, more sound, less still, less small than it really is. Although the voice of the Spirit is usually a still small voice, it is nevertheless ever sure. He goes on, it's ever sure penetrating, pervasive, edifying, and sustaining. So now he's taking something that's tiny, it's small, it's not something that's really easy to hear or necessarily rely on, and making it much bigger and more reliable, mainly by the force of his rhetoric rather than the actuality of the doctrine. All we'd have to do is ask George Albert Smith between the years of 1947 in 1949, where we have documentation, and ask how effective is that still small voice when it comes to the th- doctrines around those of color. And the truth is, if we're just honest, the truth is that that still small voice in discerning whether something is a true belief or a false belief is absolutely useless. Right. So in order to lead in to where we are halfway through his talk, I just want to briefly recap where he's come from and what he has led up to this point in his talk. He starts off by talking about the assignment he had as a general authority on what we both believe was the Strengthening Church Members Committee. At any rate, it had to do with his reading all this negative information about the church, and he mentions briefly there the gloom he felt in so doing. He then talks about how the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true church. It is the kingdom of God. It will stand forever. The question is whether you will stand. So he takes the issue and the question of whether the church is true off the table at the outset. That's very important for the structure of his talk. That's not even up for discussion. He then goes into deception is a sign of our time so that he can label anything that challenges the church or challenges our belief in the church as deception. The church never deceives anybody. It's only people who disagree with the church that are in the business of deceiving. He then spends a section of his talk talking about how people who disagree with the church and who go out and find information negative to the church on the internet are not necessarily evil. They're just wrong, 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 and wrong. And then he gets into the meat of his talk where he talks about those primary questions and secondary questions where he says, we don't need to deal with the secondary questions of church history, all these questions that are leading people out of the church. All we have to do is look over here at these other primary questions, the questions he designates as primary. Is there a God? Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? Was Joseph Smith a prophet? And is the LDS Church the kingdom of God on the earth? This is, by the way, what we call in the legal profession, bright, shiny, things. When we don't want the audience to look at the things that are going to hurt our case, which are what he calls the secondary questions, we say, don't look at that. Look over here at these bright, shiny things. And the bright, shiny things in his talk are the primary questions. The primary questions are the things he says you have to answer first. So you answer the primary questions first with no evidence. And once you've decided that Joseph Smith was a prophet, then the evidence that shows he wasn't a prophet doesn't matter or the evidence that challenges the belief that he was a prophet doesn't matter, or at a minimum, all that evidence falls into place with the conclusion that you've already reached, which is that Joseph Smith was a prophet. We went over that in some detail. I'm just wanting to hit the high points to lead into where we are now. Finally, he talks about the different ways of learning. He talks about the scientific method, the analytical method, the academic method, and then he says, The divine method is the fourth way, which is better than and trumps all the other methods. He says it incorporates elements of the other methodologies, but ultimately trumps everything else by tapping into the powers of heaven. Well, he doesn't need a fourth method. He doesn't need a divine method if the other three methods lead to the conclusion that he wants, 
which is that Joseph Smith is a prophet and that the LDS Church is true. The divine method is only necessary because the other three methods lead to the opposite conclusion. Therefore, by asking God and hearing by the still small voice that the church is true and that Joseph Smith was a prophet, that trumps all the evidence that contradicts that conclusion. At this point in his talk, it's titled, That Which Doth Not Edify, and he spends a good deal of time talking about this gloom that he felt and that he talked about just a little bit at the beginning of his talk, but he's going to go into a great deal more depth about this gloom that he felt when he was reading the quote-unquote antagonistic material as part of his calling as a general authority. Now, as you listen to this, and as you listen to Elder Corbridge describe his experience reading this material, what you will hear is a classic case of cognitive dissonance. He is going to experience and explain his experience of feeling gloom and great feelings of gloom at reading this material. This is cognitive dissonance. Now, he calls it belief bias. And actually, I think that's not completely accurate. Well, we can talk about that a little bit more later. But in order to set the stage for this, Bill, could you explain what cognitive dissonance is? So anytime you are stuck between two beliefs, two options, and this what's on the line is important, something something important to you. It's not like you're deciding between a hot dog for dinner and a steak. Uh, and you're, and you're, you know, you're, you're twisted up in knots over that. No, it has to be an important belief. So if I am wrestling with something serious in my life and belief systems within religion tend to be that kind of thing, something we've invested our life in. So whether it's a relationship with our significant other, let me give a good example. So four years ago, I was working as a carpet salesman in Sandusky, Ohio, and actually in Port Clinton, Ohio, but I lived in Sandusky. And I loved my job. I'd been there 16 years, but I was still the low man on the totem pole. And all of a sudden, an opportunity comes along to work for people who were listeners to the podcast. They became my friends really quickly in the case of in the course of two days. And they offered me a position with the company here in Southern Utah. But I didn't know them that well. They didn't know me that well. I didn't know what Southern Utah was going to be like. My family lived in Ohio. And so I was at this job that was, in, in all reality, it was a, a dead-end job. I was still the low man in the totem pole after 16 years. Uh, I wasn't going anywhere. But I liked my work. And now I've got this opportunity to come to Southern Utah, but now i got to leave family. Now i got to take a risk. Now I don't know what's going to happen there. Maybe it works out. Maybe it doesn't. When we're stuck between two options or more than two options, and there are serious costs on the line, we get all knotted up. We don't know what to do. We feel stuck like we're on the fence. And that feeling, that discomfort that we experience through that is called cognitive dissonance. That feeling will hang around as long as we are on the fence. The moment we make a decision like whether it goes good or whether it goes bad, here's what I'm going to do. The moment we make a decision, the cognitive dissonance, that discomfort goes away. So the moment I made a decision to take the job here in Southern Utah, the risk were still there. I still hadn't, you know, I still didn't know whether it was going to work out or not. But the moment I made the decision to do it, the feelings dissipated. What needs to be understood here is that our brains don't like that discomfort. We don't like being stuck between positions. So our brains have a lot of mechanisms within them that are pushing us to make one decision or the other, like just make a decision and just live with it. Uh, and I think there's a lot of that going on in what Elder Corbridge is talking about. Right. And this is why it's called a faith crisis. Now, crisis is a word that frequently gets misused in our common parlance. We often talk about a crisis as some sort of horrible tragedy or a really bad thing that's happening. Crisis actually is the point at which a decision has to be made to go one way or the other. It comes from Greek tragedy. It is the point in the play and it's the point in our lives, which will happen from time to time, when circumstances combine to force us to make one decision or another. And as you say, it's usually a meaningful decision. And the more meaningful that decision is to us personally, the greater the crisis is and the greater the feelings that we have regarding it. As the cognitive dissonance, 
what's happening here in a religious context, and I've experienced it, Bill, you've experienced it, probably pretty much every one of our listeners has experienced. It's obvious that Elder Corbridge has experienced it, and I think continues to experience it to this day. What that cognitive dissonance is, is a commitment to a religious belief. I'm just speaking in a religious context now, because that's the context of the talk. Commitment to a religious belief system, and then encountering information that contradicts that belief system. So we have the information now. We have read it. He read it on assignment. He has to deal with that somehow. This is cognitive dissonance. He now has two ideas in his mind that are mutually contradictory, and that causes upset in our mind, which wants to just have things go one way. We want to be able to resolve all the information that we have in one harmonious manner. We don't like, as human beings, having conflicting ideas going on in our brain at the same time. So what he does is he has a classic faith crisis. He experiences extreme cognitive dissonance. And the whole point of this talk is to explain to us how he, Elder Corbridge, went about dealing with his faith crisis. Are we ready to play this tape now so we can hear Elder Corbridge explain his personal faith crisis? Here he is. So what was the gloom I felt several years ago while reading antagonistic material? Some would say that gloom is the product of belief bias, which is the propensity to pick and choose only those things that accord with our assumptions and belief. The thought that everything one has believed and taught may be wrong, particularly with nothing better to take it, take its place, is a gloomy and disturbing thought indeed. But the gloom I experienced as I listened to the dark choir of voices raised against the Prophet Joseph Smith and the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ, that gloom that came as I waded chest deep through the swamp of the secondary questions is different. That gloom is not belief bias, and it is not the fear of being in, in air. It is the absence of the Spirit of God. That's what it is. It is the condition of man when left unto himself. It is the gloom of darkness and the stupor of thought. The Lord said, and that which doth not edify is not of God and is darkness. That which is of God is light. And he that receiveth light and continueth in God, receiveth more light, and that light groweth brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Revelation from the Spirit of God supersedes belief bias because it is not premised only on evidence. I have spent a lifetime seeking to hear and follow the word of the Lord. And the, and the spirit associated with the dark voices that assailed the prophet Joseph Smith, the Book of Mormon, and the Restoration are not the spirit of light and truth. They are not the spirit of God. I don't know much, but I do know the voice of the Lord. And his voice is not in that dark choir not at all in that choir. In stark stark contrast to the gloom and sickening stupor of thought that pervades the swamp of doubt is the spirit of light, intelligence, peace, and truth that attends the events and the glorious doctrine of the Restoration, especially the scriptures revealed to the world through the prophet Joseph Smith. Just read them. And ask yourself and ask God if these are the words of deceit, delusion, or truth. All right, so Elder Corbridge here is, he, he this is important, and, and this is so important to him. This is so important to the message he wants to give his audience. It is this. 
if he's actually having cognitive dissonance, what he calls belief bias, and I don't, I don't like him changing terms that we as human beings have already collectively set, but he does. Um, but it's cognitive dissonance that he's talking about. If he allows the reality, which is that when we dive into the secondary material, these, these data points, this historical context of Mormonism, if we allow that what is being felt is cognitive dissonance, then the natural follow-up is that we're all going to have to wrestle with whether Mormonism really is true or not. And we're going to have to make a decision probably on those first three methods of discovering truth. What he needs to do is he needs to essentially switch it over, say, look, that's not what it is. This is something else. It's an absence of the spirit, which now becomes an evidence of the church. But there's two problems with his reasoning. Here's the first one. If he's right, if what he felt was an absence of the spirit, then we have to come to grips that the top 15 of the church sent this man on an assignment where he was going to lose the spirit intentionally. Like Elder Corbridge, President Nelson, and the rest of us 14 would like to give you an assignment where you're going to swim in the antagonistic material and you're going to experience an absence of the Holy Ghost. That makes no sense at all to me, number one. Number two is the reality that if it's an absence of the Spirit, as long as you either continue to swim in the antagonistic material or you fall away from the church, you're going to continue to have an absence of the Spirit and experience the same thing. That's not true here. For the hundreds of thousands of former members of the church who have left Mormonism, who have come to a conclusion that it is not what it's claimed, those people are living out their lives in various ways. Some of them uh, wonderfully and happy. Some of them have uh, challenges in life that are are more difficult. And, And so there's certainly different levels of joy or happiness or success. But that's the human experience. My anecdotal data, having my own life, as well as watching the lives of many of these people who go through this journey, is that they are happier and feel more fulfilled with life. They are experiencing still spiritual experiences. Maybe they believe in God, maybe they don't, but they're still having the same kinds of experiences that they had in Mormonism. If they go to a concert or a play or they read a good book or watch a great movie or they're meditating or they go on some type of retreat, they're still having the same experience that a Latter-day Saint would describe as the Holy Ghost. I can speak for myself. I'm excommunicated four and a half months ago, I think, somewhere along there. When I was excommunicated, I had no difference in feeling. My ability to reason and logic, my ability to feel inspired, my ability to be happy, if anything, it's gone up. If Elder Corbridge is right that this is an absence of the Spirit, that until one comes back into the church or lets go of the antagonistic material, one should feel dark and empty. But the reality is that it is anything but that. So those are those two. He also says the thought that everything one has believed and been taught may be wrong, particularly with nothing better to take its place, is a glooming and disturbing thought indeed. When he says that line, my heart goes out to him because I experienced this. So there was a point in my transition where I thought Mormonism is unhealthy and something's deeply wrong here and it in fact may not be true but I'm scared to death of what lies on the other side if I give up on this. If I leave Mormonism, where do I go? And it's this whole threat that he throws out at the beginning. It's the threat that Elder Ballard threw out uh, a couple of years ago. Where will we go? The idea that you have no idea what could happen if you leave the church, and there's a lot of risk, again, again, that points to the cognitive dissonance. The moment I made the decision that I was no longer going to attend church, the cognitive dissonance disappeared within 10 minutes. And I was at complete peace. My wife was at complete peace. My kids were at complete peace with the decision that we had made to stop going to church. There is fear 
that there is nothing to replace it. And lots of critics of me have pointed out, Bill, you're helping people deconstruct Mormonism and you're not giving them anything to put in its place. Amen. Because they'll figure it out. Yes, there's a fear there's nothing to replace it. The reality is something will replace it. And the majority of people who walk away are happier and more fulfilled when they do. Yes, I'm really amazed and surprised and somewhat impressed that Elder Corbridge is going to be this open about his personal faith crisis. Now, of course, he's only doing that because he already has the spin in place. He already has the answer in place to explain why this really was not a faith crisis. This really was a faith-building experience. But you're right, Bill. How is it that a general authority in the church who is high up in the church, he's been given this calling, he's on assignment from his leaders in the church, the top 15, to read through this material, one would presume that in all other respects, he's following the commandments, he's doing everything he's supposed to do, he's living his life in harmony with the teachings of the church. Why is it that he, in that position, feels a complete absence of the Spirit as he frames it? That doesn't seem to make any sense to me. I think that really he's being self-descriptive and describing his own experience when he says, the thought that everything one has believed and been taught may be wrong. This is his experience. He experienced the thought that everything he has believed and been taught may be wrong. And he says, it is a gloomy and disturbing thought indeed. This is his own experience. And the reason he experienced it is because of the antagonistic material he was reading. Now, once again, I want to go back to something I said in part one. I said that the only reason it would cause these feelings is because what he's reading is true, accurate, correct information. It's not anti-Mormon lies. It's not that disinformation or misinformation he talks about earlier. Think about it. He's a general authority. He is encountering information about the history of the church that is troubling to him, that is causing him to doubt everything that he has believed and been taught that he thinks it may be wrong. Well, what does he have to do? All he has to do is call up people from the church history department, right? Just pick up the phone, go drop by and visit him, talk to Stephen Harper, talk to any of these people. I'm encountering this information about Joseph Smith, about the book of Abraham, about polygamy, about the way Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. Is this true? And Stephen Harper says, well, yeah, it is. Okay, boom. Now it's real information. Only real information causes this, or at least information that one believes is true. Let me give you an example of that. The salamander letter. You remember the salamander letter, right, Bill? I do. <laughs> back in the, I lived through this back in the 1980s. Here comes the salamander letter. Basically, everybody believes it is true. The church believes it is true. And for those who don't know, the salamander letter was a letter purportedly written by Martin Harris to W.W. W. Phelps in October of 1830 describing what Martin Harris, one of the uh, the translators or the dictators or the scribes, I should say, of at least the first 116 pages of the Book of Mormon, a close associate of Joseph Smith, describing what Joseph Smith and or his dad had told him about Moroni and the plates. And Moroni initially shows up in this hole in the ground as a salamander, right? And then he sort of magically transforms himself into a spirit, not an angel, but a spirit. And this is the guardian of the plates. And this is this letter which just sent shockwaves throughout the church. So much so that Elder Oaks actually had to appear in prime time and address a huge audience of Latter-day Saints and describe why it is that this letter does not crack the foundation of Mormonism. And I think that talk is still available on the church website. Well, what happens, of course, is that we find out then that it's a fraud. It's a forgery. Mark Hoffman made this up. And so we can see that prior to knowing it's a forgery, while we think it's true as a church, it's causing massive cognitive dissonance. It's causing these feelings of gloom and being disturbed because we're thinking, is everything that we've taught and believed, could that be wrong? Does the salamander letter show that? That's causing the cognitive dissonance. But as soon as the point came that Mark Hoffman kills two people and we find out that it's a fraud, the entire church breathes a collective sigh of relief because now that it's a fraud, it doesn't challenge 
our beliefs anymore. The cognitive dissonance goes away. So this is a long way of explaining why it is that it's only information that we understand is true and that is true in his case, because he can verify whether it's true or not with a call to the history department in the church. It's only the information that's true that causes this cognitive dissonance for him. Did that make sense, Bill? Yeah, that essentially Elder Corbridge here in this talk is showing his cards that he agrees that he found it troubling that the secondary questions and the data associated with them is factual data. Yes. And he goes on to talk about and recognize cognitive dissonance as an actual phenomenon. Once again, he uses the incorrect term belief bias. He's actually talking about confirmation bias. And confirmation bias is the tendency to pick and select what it is that we listen to or read that confirms what we already believe. But really what he's describing is a separate psychological phenomenon called cognitive dissonance, as we've discussed. Also, notice the emotion in his talk here. He has more emotion in this part of his talk than any place else in his talk. He is not just reliving something that happened in the past that he can look at dispassionately now about his experience. He is reliving it. He continues to have these emotions within him. And what he's trying to do desperately, it seems to me, is to argue why it is that the cognitive dissonance he experienced does not mean that the church is not true. And really, that's the entire point of his whole talk. What he says is the cognitive experience that I experienced when I encountered negative information by using what? The first three methods, the scientific, the analytical, and the academic method. All this gloom, all this despair that I experienced. How do I get around that? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that is not cognitive dissonance. He says it's not belief bias. He says it's the absence of the spirit of God. Yeah, but as we point out, that's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's especially illogical because the logical conclusion from what he's arguing is that cognitive dissonance is a legitimate psychological phenomenon. Everybody knows it, Bill. You know it. I know it. The psychologists know it. This is understood and accepted. Even Elder Corbridge understands it and accepts it. And by the way, he has to explain to his audience, he has to make a special point of explaining to his audience why what he experienced was not cognitive dissonance. Even though he says, yeah, it could be. The thought that everything one has believed and been taught may be wrong is a gloomy and disturbing thought indeed. But that's not what was happening to me, see. So the logical conclusion of what he's saying is cognitive dissonance can happen in every religion in the world except for Mormonism. If you're a Jehovah's Witness and you are devout and then you encounter information that contradicts your basic truth claims, you can experience cognitive dissonance. That's not an absence of the spirit. That's cognitive dissonance. But if a Mormon general authority or lay member does the same thing, they're devout, and they encounter information through the other three methods that contradicts their position and their beliefs and makes them question whether everything that they believe and taught has been wrong, that's not cognitive dissonance. That's an absence of the spirit of God. And that's why this argument ultimately fails because it says cognitive dissonance can exist anywhere in the world except in the LDS church. This is a cognitive dissonance free zone. Yeah. And to some extent, I think it's fair to say that you can't have both. In, in other words, you can't experience cognitive dissonance because the information you're reading is true, meaning the church isn't true in spite of the opposite that you're trying to hold which is the sacred belief that it is. So the idea that you're torn between two things. One is I've invested my entire life and heart into this religious system. I've given it my time, my resources, my energy. I love it, and it has been so good to me. And on the other hand, I'm reading this info which contradicts all the truth claims of my church and points to the idea that my church is not true. I can either experience cognitive dissonance or it's an absence of the spirit. An absence of the spirit. Like, he's trying to make space that both can exist, but he really doesn't want to make space that both could exist. Because you really can't. In other words, if Elder Corbridge is claiming that what's really going on here is an absence of the spirit, then it allows us to dismiss the secondary issues as not valid. 
But for cognitive dissonance to exist, the secondary issues have to be valid. And you can't have both of those ideas juxtaposed against each other in the same space. Either the secondary issues are pointing at a real problem, hence I feel cognitive dissonance, or they don't point to a real problem. And as you point out, if the issue is not really valid, like once the salamander letter is discovered, then cognitive dissonance should not be present at all. And yet the way he words it is kind of like, yeah, you could feel that thing, but that's not what this was. It, again, points to the fact that he's not making an argument that uses a lot of rationale and logic. No, in fact, it contradicts rationality and logic. Just a couple more points. I have felt this gloom and stupor of thought. I remember specifically experiencing it shortly after I was baptized in 1978, and my brother, the Jehovah's Witness, brought home some anti-Mormon literature from his kingdom hall for me to read. I read it. It challenged my beliefs. They were newly acquired beliefs, but I was extremely committed to them. I felt the gloom. I felt the darkness. I felt the despair. And certainly I could have rationalized that the same way Elder Corbridge is doing. And I probably did actually saying, oh, well, this is an absence of the spirit. And therefore what that allows me to do, or at least allowed me to do for a brief period of time, Bill, was to say, if I feel the absence of spirit, when I read things negative about the church, that proves the church is true. This is sort of what Elder Corbridge is getting at. If you read things about the church that make you feel good and make you feel the spirit, then that proves the church is true. And if you read negative things about the church that make you feel this cognitive dissonance, these feelings of gloom and being disturbed, well, that also proves the church is true. It's heads I win, tails you lose. Everything proves the church is true. A couple of other things. First, I've noted the emotion, and if you want to go back and play this section again, you will note the emotion, and actually, as you were playing it, I was reading along with the text of it, and I noticed that at one point, his emotion was so strong, he missed several words in his talk. He's reading it off a teleprompter. Every time you miss words doesn't mean that you're feeling emotion. You could just get confused, but in the combination of the emotion that he's expressing and that I'm hearing in his voice, and then his missing certain words... I am seeing a man who is extremely emotional about the issue. We know he's emotional about it. He's describing how emotional he is. He even said that this was bothering him so much that he wrote a response to the issues he's encountering, not for the public, but for his own benefit. Remember, he said that at the beginning of his talk. This is how troubled he is. And what he did was he was so troubled by this true information that is causing the cognitive dissonance in him and these feelings of gloom that he had to come up with a way of showing why those don't matter. In other words, I'm going to come up with a way. This is how I'm going to deal with my faith crisis. This is how I'm going to resolve the cognitive dissonance is come up with an elaborate and ultimately irrational way of saying all this information that I'm getting from the first three methods doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the still small voice. And he actually says this in a very interesting sentence in this clip you just played, Bill, where he says this. Now, listen to this sentence. I had to read this like 10 times for it to make any sense to me. He says, revelation from the spirit of God supersedes belief bias. Now, when he says belief bias, we know he's talking about cognitive dissonance. So I'm going to insert that instead. Revelation from the spirit of God supersedes belief cognitive dissonance because it is not premised only on evidence. And I'm going to actually take out the word only there because that's what he means. He says revelation from the spirit of God supersedes confirmation, excuse me, cognitive dissonance because it is not premised on evidence. So now we can get a confirmation of what we believe through the revelation from the Spirit of God that is not based on evidence that we get from the first three methods. In fact, it ends up contradicting what we get from the first three methods. But that is what makes it so superior, is that this fourth method, the divine method, revelation from the Spirit of God, supersedes cognitive dissonance caused by the first three methods because it is not premised on the evidence that is produced by the first three methods. 
Yeah, it seems like too, and, and I think you're saying this, but I think that uh, as I read that sentence, it, the thought enters my head when he says revelation supersedes a cognitive dissonance. What he's saying is that I read the secondary issues, the data points at the church not being true, the facts are deeply bothering to me, but my but this good feeling of the spirit, what I'm calling the Holy Ghost, trumps that. So hence all the, you know the data is pointing at the church not being true, but it's still true anyway because I got a good feeling. Right. And the thing that makes this interesting is that uh, a person like when I was 18 and reading this uh, anti-Mormon literature and feeling these feelings of despair and everything and gloom, I could attribute that to the lack of the spirit, okay? The difference between me and Elder Corbridge is that I was not aware of the psychological phenomenon of cognitive dissonance. So I can't attribute it to cognitive dissonance. Elder Corbridge is aware of it and says he's aware of cognitive dissonance, but now he's going to distinguish the two and say, what I felt was not cognitive dissonance. I know it sounds a lot like cognitive dissonance, and I know that the thought that everything one has believed and been taught may be wrong is a gloomy and disturbing thought indeed, but what I was feeling was not cognitive dissonance because what I was feeling was not cognitive dissonance. That's his argument. So it's something else. It's a lack of the Spirit of God. It's not cognitive dissonance. And then notice his language. Here's where he sounds desperate. And I thought this the first time I listened through this talk, Bill, back in January. I thought he sounded desperate. And this is where his talk really started breaking down for me on the first listening. Notice how desperate he is to cling to his belief and to label the feelings he was experiencing, not as cognitive dissonance, but as the absence of the Spirit of God. Here's what he says. I don't know much, but I do know the voice of the Lord, and his voice is not in that dark choir, not at all in that choir. He then goes on to overcompensate in the sentence immediately following. In stark contrast to the gloom and sickening stupor of thought that pervades the swamp of doubt. See the language he's using? I see this as his being desperate to cling to the idea that the cognitive dissonance that he felt was not cognitive dissonance. Instead, it was actually the voices from the dark choir. And here's the point in his talk where more than anything else, I hear Elder Corbridge not preaching to the student body at BYU where he's giving the talk. I hear him as preaching to himself. I hear him as trying to convince himself of the truth of his position. I think it becomes crystal clear that he's admitting at every turn that the data behind the secondary questions is troubling, troubling to him. And if anybody else reads it, it's going to be troubling to them too. Now he's asking and he's imposing that the spirit, the spiritual answer, the good feeling from the Holy Ghost trumps all that. But we need to deal with the fact that he's acknowledging that this data, the data on its own without the good feeling deeply points at something troubling to him that he wallowed in that mire, as he said, for some time. I also want to point it to, you just brought up this part of the talk where he's talking about to the dark choir. Uh, his voice is not in that dark choir. For those of you who are listening because a loved one sent this to you, I think it's important that you understand when he says his voice is not in that dark choir, that's deeply offensive to those who no longer believe Mormonism and are raising a hand up in the air saying like something's unhealthy here. Once I left the feeling of being conflicted because on one hand, I wanted Mormonism to be true with all my heart. And on the other hand, the data was mounted a thousand fold in favor of it not being what it claimed. The moment I left the feeling of that, the gloom was gone. I have asked a thousand former Latter-day Saints if they could go back to believing and being naive to the info that disintegrated their belief in Mormonism. Would they? 99.9% .9 of them said no. I've had one person say yes. In spite of their loss of faith pushing them out of their religious community, despite their loss of faith damaging relationships with those they love, despite their loss of faith being difficult and full of grief and anguish as their beliefs washed away, they now on this side of the journey said they were better for it and in no way wanted to go back. Yes, the critics are frustrated. 
Yes, there are voices who are angry. Yes, there is gloom while deconstructing your faith, especially a faith tied to your very identity. But should we expect anything else when the thing you invested your life into turned out not to be what it claimed? Can you imagine the betrayal? Can you imagine the grief? Can you imagine the anguish? And on top of that, the distancing that loved ones do when one they loved is no longer one of them. But this phase doesn't last forever for most, and eventually they learn to make peace with it. And for those who do, they move on and report being better and happier than they were inside the church. Want to see the gloom disappear from your loved one? Treat them the same regardless of if they believe as you do or not. Support them in finding new community. Withhold judgment as they begin to live their life differently now that certain beliefs and the rules attached to those beliefs vanish. Don't connect their goodness to whether they live your faith system's rules or hold your faith system's beliefs, but how they care for and respect other human beings. The dark choir is those voices who ask us to diminish others based on whether they fit into our specific religious system or not. The dark choir is those who have perpetuated racism and homophobia and patriarchy. The dark choir is those voices who make another less than simply because they are different and believe differently than us. Thanks for sharing that, Bill. I think that's really helpful because we do know that a lot of people who requested that we analyze this talk have been receiving this talk from loved ones or family members who think that this will be helpful to them. And in many ways, it is not helpful. And that's why they're asking us to do this episode. One thing I wanted to mention, though, which leads into the next part of the talk, is what you said, which is he is admitting that getting into the evidence of the secondary issues, getting into church history is deeply problematic. And that is why the very next section of his talk is going to be why it is that you should not get into the secondary issues and the church history. It's titled in the written form, You Can't Learn the Truth by Elimination. So now this section of his talk will explain why it is that you should not do what Elder Corbridge had to do because he was assigned to do it. You should leave those secondary issues alone. Play the tape. There are some who are afraid the church may not be true and spend their time and attention slogging through the swamp of the secondary questions. They mistakenly try to learn the truth by process of elimination, by eliminating every doubt. That is always a bad idea. It will never work. That approach only works in the game of Clue. Life, however, is not nearly as simple. There are unlimited claims and opinions leveled against the church and the truth. Each time you track down an answer to any one antagonistic claim and look up, there is another one staring you in the face. I'm not saying you have to put your head in the sand, but I am saying you can spend a lifetime desperately tracking down the answer to every claim leveled against the church and never come to a knowledge of the most important truths. Answers to the primary questions do not come by answering the secondary questions. There are answers to the secondary questions, but you cannot prove a positive by disproving every negative. You cannot prove the church is true by disproving every claim made against it. That will never work. It is a flawed strategy. Ultimately, there has to be affirmative proof. And with the things of God, affirmative proof finally and surely comes by revelation through the Spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. To his disciples... Jesus asked, Whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but thy Father which which is in heaven. Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. 
The church of Jesus Christ is grounded on the rock of revelation, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. We are the church. You and I are the church. We must be grounded on the rock of revelation, and although we may not know the answer to every question, we must know the answers to the primary questions. And if so, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, and we will stand forever. Okay, so you can see that the thrust of this section is to dissuade people from looking at the secondary sources. In other words, dealing with the issues of church history. But the way he does this is by saying you can't learn the truth by elimination. Here's what he says in his talk. They, the people who actually try and deal with these issues or slog through the swamp of the secondary questions, no poisoning the well going on there. They mistakenly try to learn the truth by process of elimination, by attempting to eliminate every doubt. That is always a bad idea. It will never work. Now, compare that with the famous quote from Sherlock Holmes, because he used the process of elimination. In fact, he described the process of elimination as follows. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So, Listen to what Elder Corbridge is saying. He's saying the exact opposite. He's saying that doesn't work. But Sherlock Holmes says, and by the way, Sherlock Holmes is obviously a fictional character created by Arthur Conan Doyle. But his methods, the methods that Arthur Conan Doyle created for Sherlock Holmes were so significant and so important and so revolutionary at the time that he was invited into Scotland Yard to teach those methods to the detectives there who then use those methods. Nobody today even thinks twice about the process of elimination. Obviously, the process of elimination is a valid method of arriving at the truth. And as Sherlock Holmes once again said, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Compare that with what Elder Corbridge says. Elder Corbridge says, they mistakenly try to learn the truth by process of elimination, by attempting to eliminate every doubt. That is always a bad idea. It will never work. Now, that's not true. It's not a bad idea. And in many situations, it will work, Bill. The problem is, is what he's admitting here, is that it will not work with issues related to the LDS Church. It's only with the LDS Church that that process of elimination will not work. And I think the reason why is evident because of what he's already discovered when he was reading antagonistic material. He knows that you cannot eliminate every doubt in this context. And that is why the process of elimination will not work with the LDS Church. Your thoughts, Bill? I am deeply bothered by the reasoning that he's using. The reason this bothers me is because, as you point out, when we dive into an issue, we actually can eliminate things. So um, let's say I've got four children, and there were times when my four kids were younger and somebody uh, did something wrong, like there was a mistake, something got spilled on the carpet. And I would begin questioning my four kids, and I knew that the spill took place while I was at, you know, while I was at work. Well, one of my kids has an alibi. They've got some reason, right? So I can, I can learn the truth by elimination. I can say like, oh, this kid was at a friend's house all day, and this kid uh, was also out at the mall walking around with friends. And even though I can't prove that the last kid did it. They're the only kid left, so we know they did it. And what we run into here is that, as you point out, this works everywhere else but Mormonism. If I'm investigating various religious systems and I'm saying, look, I want to know where the truth is, I can go into the data. I can read about Heaven's Gate. I can read about Scientology. I can read about Jehovah's Witness, one of the, you know, the faith you just pointed out a few moments ago. 
I can look at their history. I can look at the things they did. I can use my reason and logic, and I can eliminate, no if ands, or buts, I can eliminate those churches, those religious systems, as being deeply dysfunctional and not true. Now, I understand his point. At the end of the day, he seems to be acknowledging that the evidence is strongly against Mormonism in the data, and all he's left with is, you still can't prove it, so stay here. And I'm saying that that's not the way human beings work. We don't wait for the evidence to be absolutely 100% clear cut before we make a decision. Instead, we use our reason, we use our logic, as failed as those are, and we make decisions based on what is most likely and what is most unlikely. When you dive into the data of Mormonism, Mormonism's truth claims being true are so deeply unlikely that any person who has a drop of reason to them in logic and is willing to set their spiritual experience aside, keeping in mind that all religious systems have people in them who have, reli- who have spiritual experiences, and that many interpret those spiritual experiences as their faith system being true, setting spiritual uh, experiences aside because the di- divine method is not accurate, Using the other three methods, it is reasonable, very reasonable. It's the most reasonable conclusion for the people who dive into the data to say this thing isn't what it claimed to be. His his concept that you can continue to believe in Mormonism because you can't prove it's not true, on its face, sounds great. Deep down, what he's saying is that the data does point to the church not being true, but who cares? I've had a spiritual experience. You can't prove me wrong. It's true anyway. Right. And this is the way that you can cling to your belief as well by setting aside and not getting into. He says, I'm not saying you should put your head in the sand, but I am saying you can spend a lifetime desperately tracking down the answer to every claim leveled against the church and never come to a knowledge of the most important truths. And when he says that, what I hear him saying is, I am not saying you should put your head in the sand, but I am saying that you should put your head in the sand. So he's telling everybody else, this is what you should do. Now, what he's saying is he's putting in such negative terms and such dire and distasteful terms going into the secondary material and all the horrible feelings you get. And you can spend your whole lifetime doing this kind of stuff. I mean, who wants to do that for crying out loud? Why not just go with the primary questions? So much easier. No muss, no fuss, less work gets the job done and you don't have to deal with all of these secondary issues. Once again, though, it's interesting. He acknowledges that the scope and breadth and number of difficult issues relating to the church are so many that you could spend your lifetime desperately trying to track down the answer to every claim against the church. Once again, why does God's true church have so many claims against it? So many problems with its history. But I did want to say this one thing, Bill is that he talks about the process of elimination. You know, we hear often in the church, very often, this argument about Joseph Smith translating the Book of Mormon. And we hear the argument that Joseph Smith had the equivalent of a fifth grade education. So he translates this Book of Mormon. It's 600 pages in its original edition. It's complicated. It has all of these things in it. You know the arguments. And then what is the question that is asked at the end of that? How could he possibly have done this? How could he have translated such a big book, such a complicated book? Or oftentimes we'll hear about connections between the Book of Mormon and the Old World, whether it's chiasmus, whether it's Nahum, whether it's a number of different things, right, Bill? And the question is always asked, how could Joseph Smith have known, right? You've heard that, correct, Bill? Right. Yeah. How could, how could he have done it? How could he have known? What's important for this point to identify is that that is the process of elimination. That's what that argument is based on. We use it all the time in the LDS church. What we're saying is there is no other way that Joseph Smith could possibly have translated the Book of Mormon. All other options other than by God, Revelation, and the Holy Ghost. All other possibilities are impossible, and therefore the only option left, however improbable, must be true. 
that Joseph Smith did dictate it by the gift and power of God. Now, whether the merits of that argument hold up upon closer analysis, that's a different subject for a different day. But what's important to note here is that Mormons use the process of elimination all the time in order to try and prove that Joseph Smith was a prophet and that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. It's only in this situation now that Elder Corbridge says you can't use the process of elimination here because the process of elimination in this context that Elder Corbridge is talking about is going to lead to the wrong conclusion. If I take a different issue, let's say, uh, RFM, I believe in a flat earth. I'm a flat earther. I could use the same type of logic to defend the fact that I'm going to continue believing in a flat earth and I'm going to hold that position because they mistakenly try to learn the truth by process of elimination, by attempting to eliminate every doubt. This is always a bad idea. It will never work. And you and I both know that's silly. Like my flat earth belief is false and I can eliminate that belief by looking at the evidence. What he's saying makes no sense. I understand the idea sometimes that we can't figure out what something is by eliminating other things. But the other things we eliminated, we figured out what it isn't. So while I may not be able to figure out what belief system is true, if any, I sure as hell can eliminate the faith systems I know are not true. And Mormonism, based on the data that Elder Corbridge admits is so convincing and overwhelming that he needs to make this argument in the first place, that data is so compelling that my, again, anecdotal, but my experience talking to people is that more than like 95% of people who dive down this rabbit hole of Mormon history end up outside the church. Right. And looking at this talk as a whole, I think you make a good point here, Bill. Looking at the talk as a whole, it is a giant wood tool. And what it is, is a map and a chart of how to hold to a position that is contradicted by the evidence. Generally, we hold positions that are supported by the evidence. What he's saying here is the LDS church position of its truth claims is not supported by the evidence. It's contradicted by the evidence. But here is the way to hold to those truth claims, even though the evidence contradicts it. Yeah, he's created a flow chart where everything leads back to the church being true, regardless of how convincing the evidence is otherwise. Right. And that leads into his next section. We are getting close to the end. So that segues into the next part of his talk, where he talks about believing extraordinary things, believe miraculous things, believe in the resurrection, and specifically Mormon-related believe that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon by putting a stone in a hat and then putting his face over the hat and dictating it. This is something I think that bothers him, and he knows that it bothers a lot of people, and that's why he's going to include that in his list of extraordinary things. And he's going to be engaging in an extended rhetorical exercise to show that those things are not really crazy or miraculous at all, and they are easy to believe. In fact, we should believe them. When we look around and see how miraculous everything else is in the world around us, these things become super easy to believe. Are you ready to play the tape? Let's do it. Finally, believe. Believe that with God all things are possible. We may all be taken back from time to time by the extraordinary, such as walking on water, multiplying bread and fish, raising the dead, translating gold plates with special lenses or a stone and a hat, and the visitation of angels. Some people are hard-pressed to believe extraordinary things. While it is understandable that we may be challenged by the extraordinary, we shouldn't be because ordinary things are actually more phenomenal. The most phenomenal occurrences of all time and eternity, the most amazing wonders, the most astounding developments are the most common and widely recognized. They include I am, you are, we are, 
and all that we perceive exists as well. From subatomic particles to the farthest reaches of the cosmos and everything in between, including all of the wonders of life, is there anything greater than those ordinary realities? No. Nothing else even comes close. You can't begin to imagine, much less describe anything greater than what already is. In light of what is, nothing else should surprise us. It should be easy to believe that with God all things are possible. The healing of the withered withered hand is not nearly as amazing as the existence of the hand in the first place. If it exists, it follows, it can certainly be fixed if it is broken. The greater event is not in its healing, but in its creation. More phenomenal than resurrection is birth. The greater wonder is not that life, having once existed, could come again, but that it ever exists at all. More amazing than the dead be raised is that we live at all. A silent heart that beats again is not nearly as amazing as the heart that beats within your breast right now. That one could see on a stone or or through a special lens, the modern translation of ancient texts written on plates of gold is far less amazing than the human eye. The wonder is not what the human eye may see, rather that it sees anything at all. How can you believe in extraordinary things such as angels and gold plates and your divine potential easy? Just look around and believe. I don't know if pigs will ever sprout wings and fly, but if they do, flying pigs will never be nearly as amazing as the ordinary pig in the first place. The, the ploy that he seems to be using here, RFM, is the idea that he's acknowledging we're not seeing the miraculous. We're not seeing the, the withered. And he uses this example first, which I found deeply interesting. He talks about, you know, the withered hand being healed. The, 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 the more miraculous thing is that we have hands to begin with and that hands work and that there's this, incredible organ with muscles and bones and all these things that just do, you know, the the way the world functions is such a miracle. The idea behind a withered hand, I put a post out maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, where I said, if anybody's had a, a, a hand that was lost or they were born without an arm, if anybody's had a priesthood blessing that's had that restored, would you reach out to me? I'd like to have a conversation. Of course, nobody does. He's pointing to the fact that, listen, audience, I get that none of you are seeing supernatural miracles. They're not in your, they're not happening within your experience. So I understand why it's hard in 2019 to believe that. But you should believe it. Here's why. It's because the ordinary is even more miraculous. So if you're willing to believe that people have hands at all, then it's not a big step to believe that a withered hand could be healed. That's bad logic. It again dismisses the other three methods of understanding truth. Once you understand evolution, and yes, it is, it is beautiful. And yes, it is complicated. And yes, it is complex. Yes, we live in a world that has a ton of beauty and complexity to it. No doubt. But we can explain why, how mountains form. We can explain how evolution works. We can explain why some animals function with their body being formed a certain way and their organs being where they are and the kinds of organs they have versus a human being, which is much different. It's not rational to say that because a human hand exists and that's the greater miracle that we should then have no problem believing in supernatural miracles that cannot be explained. That to me is horrible logic. And, but what I do gather from this is he acknowledges that nobody's seeing supernatural miracles, nobody's seeing a withered hand healed, 
Nobody, of course, is seeing pigs fly because that doesn't happen. And he's trying to create a fallacy argument to both explain it and second, to drive us to believe in it by believing that the ordinary things are even more miraculous. That's bad logic. Yes, it's actually very bad logic, but it's effectively done rhetorically speaking. In fact, one could be carried away with his rhetoric and believe that what he's saying is true. But on the other hand, if you just sit with what he said and look at it for a minute, you start realizing that it doesn't make any sense. In addition to what you're talking about, I see him as trying to deal with the issue that many members have with difficulty believing that Joseph Smith translated the Book of Mormon by putting the seer stone in a hat and reading the text off of it. This is what he says, that one could see on a stone or through a special lens, the modern translation of ancient texts written on plates of gold is far less amazing than the human eye. The wonder is not what the human eye may see, rather that it sees anything at all. So he's trying to make it easy to believe in the newly acknowledged method that Joseph Smith actually used, which was hidden by the church for many, many, many decades, that Joseph Smith put a stone in a hat, and that's how he translated the Book of Mormon. Really, members have much more trouble with the fact that the church hid this fact from them, and in some ways continues to hide that fact from the members of the church, than the actual method that's claimed to be used. But the bad logic is here. The fact is that the human eye is an amazing thing. The human body is an amazing thing. Pigs are amazing things. But there's billions of them, Bill. There are billions of people on the earth today. You multiply it by two, that's how many human eyes there are on the earth today. There are billions of people. They're amazing, but they're not miraculous. They're everywhere. What it would be miraculous is if somebody who died came back to life because that just doesn't happen. If you're a Christian, you believe it happened once and maybe with a few other people, if you're Mormon, with Jesus. But other than that, it doesn't happen. People die and they stay dead. That is the universal rule. So if someone violates that and is resurrected, that would be really much more miraculous than the fact that people exist in the first place. So just to underscore how bad this logic is. Let me just read this line that he says, while it is understandable that we may be challenged by the extraordinary, we shouldn't be because ordinary things are actually far more phenomenal. Now, when he says far more phenomenal, what he means is extraordinary, right, Bill? Yeah, supernatural. So if I put extraordinary there in place of phenomenal, you'll see how bad this logic is. While it is understandable that we may be challenged by the extraordinary, we shouldn't be because ordinary things are actually far more extraordinary. Well, ordinary things are not extraordinary, and they're certainly not far more extraordinary than ordinary things. That's why we use the term ordinary and extraordinary. <laughs> extraordinary is by definition more unusual than the ordinary. So just that alone shows how bad his logic is. But he's, he's moving this argument toward a certain end. And he wants for people just to believe, believe with God, all things are possible. And once you believe that with God, all things are possible, anything that is claimed to have happened, no matter how crazy or irrational or unlikely or otherwise impossible becomes possible because God can do anything. It is the panacea for all the ills that plague Mormon history. With God, all things are possible. And therefore, anything could have happened. And in fact, it's easier to believe these crazy things than it is to believe the ordinary things, because the ordinary things are actually more extraordinary than the extraordinary things. Right. The ordinary things are more extraordinary than the extraordinary things. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so now he goes <laughs> and so now he goes on to this this next part of his talk. Now, he has his conclusion, right? But if you look at the written version, now he has a section called doubts and questions and there's just two paragraphs. There's actually only three sentences. It's this tiny little section, doubts and questions. Now, we know that he has doubts. He's expressed to us that at least in the past he's had serious doubts about the church. Listen to what he says about doubts and questions and how he doesn't have any doubts. He has lots of doubts, excuse me, he has lots of questions, but he doesn't have any doubts. And I kind of get the feeling 
that maybe he's saying that to convince himself and to portray himself as not having doubts when actually this man is riddled with doubts. Play the tape. I heard someone say recently, it's okay to have doubts. I wonder about that. The Lord said, look unto me in every thought. Doubt not. Fear not. I have a lot of questions. I don't have any doubts. And the reason he doesn't have any doubts is because he has chosen to ignore them. He has chosen to put them aside and to allow his argument of the spirit, the still small voice, trumping his doubts to rule the day. But they are still there. They are swimming just under the surface. And like that great line from the movie Jaws, I think you're going to ignore this particular problem, Elder Corbridge, until it swims up and bites you in the ass. <laughs> he is swimming as hard as he can away from yeah. these doubts, but believe me, they're getting... Yeah, no, it, it. as we pointed out, I think maybe a half dozen times at this point, this guy was deeply troubled by the data he found on the assignment from his church leaders. And he was questioning the truth claims of the church and has come up with this incredible Rube Goldberg machine uh, in order to keep it all together. And I can't imagine what would happen if somebody explained to him the irrationality, the, the lack of logic in his absence of the spirit explanation and helped him understand what cognitive dissonance really was. And sat down with him and went over these issues and showed why taking simply a handful of issues, Book of Abraham, Joseph's translation productions and how much plagiarism there is from contemporary sources, Joseph Smith's polygamy showing a lack of fidelity and uh, integrity, race and the priesthood showing how wrong prophets can be when they are so sure they are right. And when you take those four, five, six issues it all comes crumbling down. And if he had to deal with the fact that that feeling he has is cognitive dissonance, which means that the data really is compelling, which he, which he again, admits throughout this talk, I have to wonder what would happen to good old Elder Corbridge. Yes, and now he gets to his conclusion. And his conclusion is really his testimony. But it is structured in a way that mirrors his talk. He's going to mention all four of his primary questions about there's a God in heaven, Jesus is the son of God, Joseph Smith was a prophet, and the LDS church is the kingdom of God, and he's going to mention them in order. And after he mentions each one, he is going to go through all four of the methods that he has laid out. The scientific method, which he described, remember, as being experience. It's our experience. He's going to go through the analytical method, which is weighing the evidence. He's going to go through the academic method, which is studying. And then he's going to go to what he calls the divine method, which is the spirit of God. So let me just read the first one. He follows the exact same pattern with the exact same language with all four of his primary questions. He'll say, there is a God in heaven who is our eternal father. I know this by my experience. Okay. Scientific method, all of my experience. So he's going to be emphatic on that. I know this by the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. That's the analytical method. I know it by study. That's the academic method. And most surely, I know it by the spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. He's going to use those same words for Jesus is the Christ, Joseph Smith was a prophet, and the LDS Church is the kingdom of God on the earth. But when he gets to Joseph Smith was a prophet, and the LDS Church is the kingdom of God, I know, based on what he's already admitted, that he is hopelessly overstating his case because he's not just saying that the Spirit of God has revealed it to him. He's saying that all four of the methods show him uncontrovertibly that Joseph Smith was a prophet. Well, we know that's not the case because he's already admitted all the feelings of gloom he experienced while reading the antagonistic material. But he'll use the same expressions with Joseph Smith. So here he's trying to establish his street cred. He's trying to establish that what he has experienced, he has not really experienced. And what I hear him doing here is a long and structured whistling past the graveyard. He he wants to act RFM 
like all four of these work together to testify the church is true, while at the same time he has self-admitted that if we don't allow the divine method to trump the other three, the other three point at the church not being true. Right. If indeed, and we, we are going to have to actually play his, his conclusion here in a second, but if indeed his conclusion were accurate, he never would have had to have given this talk in the first place, and he never would have had to have taught and said that the divine method trumps the other three methods. Right. Any one of them on their own would point to the church being true. Hence, all four of them point to the church being true. That's not the case. The first three point to the church not being true, but because I allow the fourth one to trump the other three, now the church is true again. Right. So if you play the tape here, we can listen to his own words and how his conclusion contradicts everything he said up to this point. Perfect. Roll the tape. There is a God in heaven who is our eternal father. I know that by my experience, all of my experience. I know that by the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. I know it by study, and most surely I know it by the Spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. I know that by my experience, all of it. I know it by the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. I know it by study, and most surely I know it by the spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God who laid the foundation for the restoration of the kingdom of God. I know that by my experience, all of my experience. I know it by the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. I know it by study, and most surely I know it by the spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the kingdom of God on earth. I know that by my experience, all of it. I know it by the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. I know it by study, and most surely I know it by the spirit and power of the Holy Ghost. And with that, I know everything I need to know to stand forever. May we stand on the rock of revelation, particularly in regard to the primary questions, and if so, we will stand forever and never go away. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen, Elder Corbridge. So if I am a member of the church and I am questioning and I have family or friends who have sent me a link to this talk by Elder Corbridge in hopes of getting me to come back to the church and showing me the error of my ways, I would say, well, thank you for sending me this talk, but I don't understand why you'd send me a talk by a general authority who is obviously in the middle of his own faith crisis, the same kind of faith crisis that I went through, and think that that's somehow going to bring me back to the church. This guy's on his way out. My my thought here on his testimony is that he's already acknowledged the first three modes, if we don't allow the fourth to trump, it leads to the church being, its truth claims being in jeopardy. So when he says that, uh, I know this by my experience, all of it, that's, that is such an overstatement that it's into the realm of absurdity. He's acknowledged that on this assignment, some of his experience is troublesome. He then says, I know by the evidence, and the evidence is overwhelming. Again, if we don't allow the divine method to trump, that doesn't quite seem to be the case. I know it by study. No, the study gave you gloom. The study caused you to wallow in the mire. The study was not faith building. It was only when you allowed those three to be dismissed. By your spiritual experience, were you able to prop up your shelf and allow yourself to continue to believe? But I've got to believe, as you point out, Elder Corbridge's shelf is pretty full, and the legs that are propping it up are being whittled by the moment. No, at this point, and I don't want to do too much psychoanalyzing because it's always, uh, you know, a risky 
subject, but at this point, it is really clear to me that Elder Corbridge is in the church only because of his family connections, because of his position in the church, and because of everything that he has sacrificed in order to attain the position that he has reached. He has put so much into this church, he cannot leave now. And so he's going to try and explain to the students at BYU why it is that they should commit their lives to the church, that they should sacrifice everything that they have to the church, that they should rise through the ranks of leadership in the church so that they can get to the point that he is at and feel completely 100% trapped. I remember the moment, RFM, that I began to deeply sense within me that this thing didn't add up. And what I did was I got up in those moments and bore an even stronger testimony. I knew that if I could just stay focused in the things that are spiritual, this would, this would come back together. If I just hung on, I could figure out how to put the toothpaste back in the tube. But as you and I both know, that phase doesn't last forever. Right. Well, in one sense, fast and testimony meeting, when we bear our testimonies, is an exercise in convincing each other that the church is true. Yeah. But at some point, the first three methods of learning overwhelmed the fourth, and it all came crumbling down. So that is our analysis of the talk by Elder Lawrence Corbridge at BYU, Utah, January 22nd, 2019, titled Stand Forever. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you for being with me, Bill Real. It was my pleasure, my friend. That's about all for tonight. Until next time, this is Radio Free Mormon, signing off the air. <laughs>